Second Radio is brought to you by www.thebarefootguru.com. Visit thebarefootguru.com today for handcrafted necklaces, stones, crystals, hair feathers, primitive medicine dream catchers, smudge kits, medicine bags, all sorts of spiritual aids which will help you to stay focused and creating on purpose. You'll also find the journey back to self and how to thrive in a survival mindset world. Signed copies by the author, John Devane. All of this is at www.thebarefootguru.com. All purchases of all items found at thebarefootguru.com support Awakened Radio and help us to grow, to enhance your experience, and to reach more people with the message that together we can do more than survive. We can thrive. We have purple, passionate people power at this radio station. And we carry that energy through to our station, advertiser, and sponsor www.thebarefootguru.com Check it out today. Thank you so much. Walk in me. Good evening. And once again, you're listening to the voice of the American Dissident. And I'm your host, Jeffrey Whittler. Tonight's broadcast will be about concerning President Obama, London, England, and the Antichrist. And what I'm going to talk about with concerning President Obama is some of my thoughts and research. It's not quoted out of any particular text or any book. It's just my personal observations of the man and connecting certain dots over the years with things that I've studied and read. So... We'll get right down into the meat of the matter and start talking about this. Um, As you all know that we have a man by the name of Barack Hussein Obama, and he's the 44th President of the United States. And a lot has been said about him through uh, the last couple years that he's been President. Some people have called him the Messiah. Some people have called him the chosen one. And how does that relate to the new world order and what I talk about? Well, certain anecdotal evidence indicates that he could be the Antichrist. And I'm not talking about him being able to turn his eyes red and point a finger at somebody and stop their heart, supernatural powers. I'm talking about symbols and evidence connecting him with what the book describes, um, the Bible describes in the book of Revelations as the leader that will sit on the throne of the world and usher in Satan's reign on this earth. So to begin, we'll talk about a brief passage in the Bible. It says in the book, I believe it was Revelations or Daniel, and if I'm wrong, it just means that I'm human. It says, Here is wisdom. He who has knowledge and understanding, count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So, clearly, that the beast would be a man, a male of the species, and his number would be 666. So, to understand that, you have to know a little bit about numerology, and as it relates to the mystery schools of Babylon, occult religions, and other things that it has to do with. So if you take a look at Barack Hussein Obama, the first letters in his name are six, and then his second name, Hussein, that is six, and Obama is six. It adds up to 18, which is divisible by 3 and 6 would would give you 666. When he was inaugurated president 
I listened to everything that was said about him during that day. And what I found real interesting is, is that the Secret Service chose to uh, nickname his limousine the Beast. Now that's kind of a strange name to be giving anybody's vehicle, I guess, especially the vehicle of the President of the United States. But the beast has very a very specific meaning, and if you've under and if you've read the Bible, you know what the beast is. There's been a lot of controversy ever since he's been inaugurated president to exactly where he's been born. Some say he was born in Hawaii and he produced a birth certificate that claims he was born in Hawaii. But Sheriff Joe Arpaio, out of Arizona, he's done an in-depth investigation, and others have done an in-depth investigation, and they've proven that his birth certificate is in fact a forgery, that he was not born in Hawaii, that he was born, in fact, in Africa. Just like his family said, and just as exactly as he's covering up. In Hollywood, they tell stories. And they don't tell stories to entertain you. They make movies to send a message, not only to their brethren out in the world, but they send a message to the people of the world just exactly what they intend to do, just exactly what has been done. And they tell the real history of the world in certain movies. The Indiana Jones trilogy is a good example, talking about the occult history of Nazi Germany. Star Wars is the same thing, told by George Lucas, the Force, the Knights, of the Jedi, which symbolize the Knights Templars. But we will talk about a very specific movie called The Omen. The Omen, if some of you have me watched it, is about the birth, the rising, the ascension of the Antichrist on the throne of the world, the Devil's Son. Symbolically, they've told the story of where the Antichrist would be born as it relates to the Bible and everything else. Because the Bible itself speaks in symbols and it speaks in metaphors. There are a lot of passages in the Bible that should not be taken literally, but they should be taken symbolically. So in the movie that was made, I believe it was in 1978, the father told uh, the character that was played by Gregory Peck who the jackal would be born of, or who the Antichrist would be born of. He said that the Antichrist would be born of a jackal. The jackal is a symbol. Didn't mean, he did not mean in the movie that a human being would be literally born from an animal, because you and I know that that's an utter impossibility. The jackal is a symbol, and it is an African symbol. The jackal is a African dog, and what's interesting about a jackal is that it's hermaphroditic, meaning that there are really no males or no females, that they all interbreed with one another, and that the jackal could be mothered or fathered by an African. And that is exactly what they were talking about in the movie that was made in 1976 that the Antichrist would be born, mothered, or fathered by an African. And as you well know, that Barack Hussein Obama's father was Kenyan, so obviously he was African. So they were sending a message over 25 years ago exactly where the Antichrist would be born. And if you look at the date of when Barack Hussein Obama was born, it gives you another clue that he could possibly be, well, be the Antichrist. His birthday is August the 4th, 
1961. August is the eighth month, obviously. His birthday the fourth, which adds up to twelve. One, which adds up to thirteen. Nineteen. And nine, which adds up to twenty-two. Six, which adds up to twenty-eight. And one, which adds up to twenty-nine. Which gives you the number twenty-nine. Twenty-nine in numerology, you can multiply 2 times 9, which would give you 18, which would again give you the number 666. So there is a lot of anecdotal evidence <clears throat> right there that indicates that Barack Obama symbolizes the Antichrist. And if you've watched since he's been president, he never goes anywhere near a church that is actually consecrated in the blood of Christ. He does not attend a regular church that you and I would normally go to, a Catholic church, a Lutheran church, an Episcopalian church, a Methodist church, any church that which you can identify as being Christian, he goes nowhere near. He does not go get physical. If you've ever watched on TV, and I've watched every day when I can. He never gets sick. Much has always been said about presidents that go to Walter Reed Hospital or Bethesda Naval Hospital for their annual physicals. As far as I know, and anybody can correct me if I'm wrong and feel free to do so, he has never went to Walter Reed Hospital or Bethesda Naval Hospital for a physical. During the campaign of 2008, he released one page of medical records. And I happen to believe that he only has one page of medical records because he has never been sick in his entire life. And the one page of medical record that he has released is the phony birth certificate that shows that he was supposedly born in Hawaii. And there was also in the movie, The Omen, a poem. It says, <clears throat> When the Jews return to Zion and the comet rips the sky, then you and I must die. From the eternal sea he rises, raising armies on either shore, pitting man against his brother until man exists no more. That passage in that poem, the eternal sea, has been generally recognized by biblical scholars, the eternal sea, as one that would rise out of the world of politics. And Barack Obama has always been connected to the world of politics. His mother, when he lived in Indonesia, worked for the Central Intelligence Agency. And in what capacity, I do not know. I have not researched it very thoroughly. But he's always been connected in some way or another to government. And he is of the Illuminati bloodline. Because if you pay close attention, they do give presidential lineages. And he is a direct descendant of no less than six United States presidents. And if you don't believe that, one can go on the internet and do a search of Burke's Peerage, Presidential Families of the United States of America. Go get the book and buy it and look at the presidential pedigrees. They're all in there. Every United States president that we've ever had is a direct descendant of each other. And Mitt Romney, if he's elected president of the United States, will be no different. He is, in fact, a cousin of Barack Obama, He's a cousin of George W. Bush. He's a descendant of Franklin Roosevelt, Thomas Jefferson, Ulysses S. Grant, and every president that we've ever had. And it's well documented and well researched. And if you still don't believe it, you can contact the New England Genealog Genealogical Society. They do the research on presidential candidates and who's ever the eventual nominee, which looks like it will be Mitt Romney, at some point in time, if you watch the news very carefully, they will give his lineage. 
and you will see that in fact that I'm telling you the truth. That they are all related, they are all of one mind, they all have one goal, and the goal is the new world order. And, getting back to Barack Obama, he bears a scar on his forehead, and I believe that that, in the Bible, and anybody can correct me if I'm wrong, is the scar of Cain. And I don't know much about it. I'm a human being like everybody else. And if somebody has further research on it, feel free to post it in uh, my thread or post it on World Truth. I'm a member of World Truth as well as Awaken Radio. And you can enlighten me on that. But it, it has significance concerning the symbology of the Antichrist. And if Barack Obama is re-elected president of the United States, there will be nothing stopping him in his completion of completely so socializing the United States and bringing about a world government. And what I'm saying is it doesn't really matter if Barack Obama or, or Mitt Romney is elected president because they'll both follow the same goals. But the Illuminati, they like to follow things according to religion as well, because the Illuminati is not just a secret society. It is a religion. It's a religion that they are trying to foster off on the people, not only in the United States, but of the world. And either way, who's ever in control of the White House, whether it be Mitt Romney or Barack Obama, will not be in good shape. So, keeping that in mind, there's been much talk of London, England, and a potential attack during the Olympics. And London, England is very central in understanding just exactly how the New World Order works. It's very essential in understanding Bible prophecy it's very essential in being able to gauge what the future holds for not only the United States, but the world. And the next part of this show, I'm going to quote from you research from a well-documented book. It's called Scarlet and the Beast. And it was written by John Daniel. And the publisher, if you'll let me indulge me, is John Kriegel Publishing in Tyler, Texas. Now, I do not know if they still publish these books. You can find them on Amazon.com or you could possibly find them by doing a search on www.abebooks.com. These books are very scarce. They're very well written and they're becoming quite expensive. So if you have the means to buy these books, it's a three-volume set, I highly suggest that you go and buy them. And when you're done with them, see in your heart to share them with your friends and your family because it gives a concise history of the mystery schools, English Freemasonry, cults, mystery Babylon, and the history of the world. So what I'm going to do right now is start quoting from Scarlet and the Beast, and this would be Volume 2, English Freemasonry, Mother of Modern Cults, Vis a Vis, Mystery Babylon, Mother of Harlots. I was in a first-hand position to observe the Masons' activities and was mesmerized by their blatant self-promotion. I saw people totally unqualified for responsible posts being promoted beyond their ability, to the chagrin and bewilderment of officials who had every right to expect to post themselves. In the peculiarity school-like methods of assessing bank staff ability, I saw the appalling substandard work of Brotherhood members receive all the plaudits, while the sterling efforts of more worthwhile staff were unremarked. When promotion openings arose, their names were far ahead. Independently, assessments of Two of these executives stated they had already been promoted greatly in excess of their ability. Both are now making a frightful mess of their appointments and losing shareholders' funds. 
Short sounds the alarm to why the banking industry is in such a mess. His investigations into court cases involving Masonic bankers we have diverted company funds to crooked brethren, prompting to suggest that the commercial survival of a company, even a nation, could thus be subverted by Masonic insider trading. The biggest business in London is banking. Revelation 18 states that Mystery Babylon is the financial center of the world. The financial center of the Western world is London, and London is controlled by English Freemasonry. The financial center of the Eastern world is Hong Kong, also controlled by London. According to Reverend J.R. Church, author of Guardians of the Grail, the land on which London's financial district is located is owned by the Knights Templar, which founded French Freemasonry and is English Freemasonry's adversary. This fact may be the literal truth of the symbol of Scarlet sitting on the Templar beast. London sits on seven mountains. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet, a scarlet covered beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The seven heads are seven mountains, on which the woman sitteth, and the woman which thou sawest is the great city, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Revelation chapter 17, verses 3, 9, and 18. Mystery Babylon has often been identified with the Roman Catholic Church, in part because Rome is literally built on seven hills. Bible prophecy scholars have often taken this scripture literally, looking to Rome as the seat of the whole of Babylon. Reverend Alexander Hislop's book, The Two Babylons, written in 1916, was partially based upon this premise. Biblical commentators English and Bauer, however, give us another understanding of the word mountain. Commenting on Psalms chapter 72, verse 3, they state that the word, word mountain in the scripture often speaks of political and governmental powers and kingdoms. Hills are lesser powers, small states. With this understanding of mountains and hills, we can look at this passage of scripture in a new light. According to Revelation chapter 17 verse 9, the seven mountains on which the horse sits are not literal mountains, but are the same seven heads or world powers of the beast. William Getz in Apocalypse next identifies six of them as historic world powers, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. All six empires had a profound yet singular effect on Israel. At the time of John's vision in 90 AD, the seventh head or power had not yet come into being. Revelation chapter 17 verses 10 and 11 gives us a clue as to when the seventh will arise. Quote, And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet to come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven. Of the seven kings here mentioned by John, the one king that is, is the existing empire of his time, Rome. Rome, then, is the sixth head or power. What, then, is the seventh world power that must continue a short space? Clearly, the eighth head is not the seventh, is the apocalyptic beast. The prophet Daniel in chapters 2, 7, and 8 saw the beast as revived Rome. Therefore, the seventh head cannot be revived Rome, for revived Rome is reserved for the beast's eighth head. The phrase, the seventh, must continue a short space, indicates that the seventh world power must rise and fall rapidly, sometime between the sixth, old Rome, and the eighth, new Rome. To discover what nation the seventh world power is, we must look at the distinctive features of the previous six, for all seven have the same characteristics. First, the six were controlled by sun-worshipping masonry. Babylon, Revelation chapter 17, verse 9. Second, each had a profound yet singular effect on Israel. John adds two more distinctions for identifying the seventh. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 10, he informs us that the seventh must be short-lived. And in Revelation chapter 12, verse 13 and 18, John indicates that Israel must be reconstituted nation before the eighth beast can arise. Israel was reconstituted a nation in 1948. Therefore, the seventh head had to have been a nation that one rose and fell rapidly sometime before 1948. Two, worshipped the sun god. Three, was controlled by modern mystery Babylon, English Freemasonry. And four, had a profound effect on the Jews. Clearly, the seventh head or world power is Nazi Germany. For Germany under Nazism fits the above-mentioned criteria. 
It rose and fell rapidly before 1948. It worshipped an occult ideology and figure whose emblem was the swastika, which we have seen is an eastern occult symbol of the sun. We learned in volume one of Scarlet and the Beast that Germany and Hitler were supported and raised up by the powers and personages of English Freemasonry. And we know that Nazi Germany conducted systematic genocide against the Jews. Listed below are the seven historic world powers, the sun god and the profound yet singular effect on, of each on Israel. World power, Egypt, sun god Osiris, the exodus about 1400 BC. Two, Assyria, sun god Baal, scattered the ten northern tribes in 721 BC. Three, Babylon, sun god Marduk, took Judah and Benjamin captive in 606 B.C. 4. Persia, sun god Zoroaster, sent a remnant back to Jerusalem in 536 B.C. 5. Greece, sun god Zeus, prepared the Jews for the first coming of the Messiah. 6. Rome, sun god Jupiter, scattered the Jews among the Gentile nations in 70 A.D. 70 AD. 7. Nazi Germany, swastika, symbol of the sun. Holocaust forced Jews to resurrect Israel in 1948. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 and 2, chapter 17 verse 9. The body of the seven-headed and ten-horned beast consists of a leopard, a bear, and a lion. The composite nature of the beast may represent three regions of the world. The seven heads are historically identifiable nations. By the time the beast, the eighth head rises to power. Yet Revelation chapter 17 verse 9 appears to indicate that the seven heads are also seven end-time nations, for the whore of Babylon sitteth, in the present tense, on seven mountains. There are several prophecies in scripture which, like Revelation chapter 17 verse 9, set a dual prophetic precedence. One is found in Daniel chapter 11, where the prophet is foretelling the rise and fall of the Grecian Empire. According to English and Bauer, verse 21 is the prophecy of the rise of Antiochus, Epiphanes, who ruled Syria three centuries later, around 175 B.C. As Daniel's vision unfolds, the commentators state that it is evident Antiochus becomes a type of the tribulation beast. Thus, Daniel's one prophecy covered two future events. One was 300 years from his time, and the other was to occur at the end time. Likewise, the seven heads on the beast in Revelation chapter 17 verse 9 appear to refer to historic nations as well as to nations existing at the end time. Ancient mystery Babylon sat on or controlled six historic world powers. Modern masonry mystery Babylon, English Freemasonry sat on, that is, funded and controlled the seventh, Nazi Germany. Likewise, English Freemasonry is today in control of the contemporary seven-nation Trilateral Commission. The Trilateral Commission is a third-generation offspring of English Freemasonry. The first-generation offspring is the Round Table. The second generation consists of three Round Table groups, the Council on Foreign Relations, Royal Institute of International Affairs,
connect with me uh, and let me know how you'd like to interact with our station. I want to remind you our station is listener supported. This means you're helping us get the word out, you're helping us promote it, and you're helping us to pay the bills by clicking and shopping with our advertisers, by visiting www.com, by shopping on Donna Devane on Amazon and checking out some of her great books. Uh, and also, I have a couple of copies. If you like what you do here, if you like what we're doing as a radio show, come on, pay it for us. Help us reach more people with the message that humanity is blessed with us, that we can, we can make changes that are better for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you for spreading the word. Thank you for your support. Most of all, Let's go, Wake Radio. Let's go, Wake Radio. You are not listening to Wake Radio. Just sit back, relax, follow along, shake up a lot of bugs. Spirituality will look you in the eye and tell you that's what. She's a real fun gal, really one of a kind. She'll look you in the eye and tell you that's fine. Break down. A to the W to the A to the K to the E to the N to the E to the D to the R to the A to the B I O. What's that spell? Awaken Radio. Let's go. Awaken Radio. Let's go. And we are back once again with the American Dissident, and we're going to continue with our discussion and study of London as being Babylon from the Bible. And I'm quoting for you out of a well researched book entitled Scarlet and the Beast. And if you don't have a pen and paper, I would suggest that every night, Saturday, that you listen to this radio program. Have a pen and paper by you because the information that I'll give you is very valuable in aiding your research. Because if you don't believe me, you don't have to believe me. A search for truth and the quest for knowledge comes from within. You have to do your own homework and do your own research to confirm what I'm saying. Always listen to everything and believe nothing unless you can confirm it in your own research. And that is quoting a hero of mine. His name was William Cooper. We had a radio show called The Hour of the Time. And once again, I'll give you the title of this book. It's Scarlet and the Beast. And it was written by John Daniel. And it was published by John Kriegel Publishing in Tyler, Texas. And as I said, you can do a search on Amazon.com and you can find the books there. And I suggest if you have the means to buy this three volume set and once you've read them share them with your friends and share them with your family and pass them around or if you cannot find them there do another search on the internet and try ABE books www.abebooks.com or go to eBay but it's very important that some of you listening to this radio program, get this three-volume set and do your research. And when you've done your research, share what you've learned with your friends and your family. So we will continue with our study. The tri, or trilateral of course, refers to three regions of the world, North America, Western Europe, and Japan. This division may also correlate with the three-part body of the beast. Commission bespeaks the function given the Trilateral Commission by English Freemasonry to foster closer co cooperation among these three regions. The nation members of the Trilateral Commission are the seven most potent industrial powers in the world, known collectively as G7. The United States of America, Canada, Great Britain, France, Germany, Italy, and Japan. Membership also includes the heads of major oil companies, multinational corporations, and international banks. Aristocrats, politicians, and heads of state are members as well, including all our presidents since Jimmy Carter. Since its founding, the Trilateral Commission has met annually to discuss solutions to common problems that hinder English Freemasonry's goal of controlling world government. A few months following each annual meeting, 
the heads of state of the seven industrial powers, the G7, hold a summit to work out a strategy for implementing the solutions, a strategy that often involves each nation's legislature. As did the seven historical world powers have a profound effect on Israel, London's G7 is likewise involved in the affairs of Israel today. Below is an article from the Jerusalem Post, July 23, 1994, praising G7 for calling an end to the Arab boycott against Israel. And I'll read to you that newspaper post. Headline, G7 Nations Call for End to Arab Boycott. Israeli officials are very pleased with the decision taken by the seven top industrialized nations at their annual meeting, which in a break from the past, unambiguously called for an end to the Arab boycott. The political communique issued last week in Naples also called for accelerated international funding for the new Palestinian Authority, something which Israeli officials welcome as well. Beginning in 1991, the G7 annual summits have linked an appeal to end the Arab boycott with a halt of Israeli settlement activity in the territories. Last year, the linkage was weakened but the call to end the boycott was offset by an appeal to end settlements. During last week's communique, settlements were not even mentioned. Foreign Ministry Assistant Director General for Economics, Oded Iron, who has spearheaded official anti-boycott efforts, said, We are very satisfied that the G7 has adopted a clear call to the Arab states to lift the Arab boycott. Israeli embassies in all seven countries quietly lobbied for the decision. Referring to settlements, Iron added, this year, the call was not diluted or balanced by a call to Israel to take certain actions. The absence of such balance is indeed justified due to the actions taken by the government. Iron was alluding to the Rabin government's slashing of settlement construction since assuming office in the summer of 1992. Communique stated, In the Middle East, economic development is essential to underpin the peace process. Thus, along with others, we are providing financial and technical assistance to the Palestinian Authority, and we are working to promote cooperation and development in the region. We call for an end to the Arab boycott of Israel. Indeed, John's seven mountains on which the woman sitteth appear to be the seven-nation trilateral commission on which English Freemasonry sits. Babylon was the dominant world power when Jeremiah prophesied. Some of his prophecies were pronounced and carried out upon the Babylon of his day. Others were directed at a future Babylon, which name describes an entity, not the literal city of Babylon. We should not, for instance, be looking for the literal city of Babylon in modern Iraq to be rebuilt to fill Jeremiah's end-time prophecy. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 13, describes the location of the end-time spiritual Babylon. O oh, you who dwell by many waters, abundant in treasures, your end has come, the measure of your end. Taken literally, this cannot mean modern Iraq, since Iraq is not surrounded by many waters, nor abundant in treasures. Great Britain, however, is abundant in treasures. She is also completely surrounded by many waters, the Atlantic Ocean to the west, the North Sea to the north and east, and the English Channel to the south. In verse 42, Jeremiah says, The sea has come up over Babylon. She has been engulfed with its tumultuous waves. Taken figuratively, sea means peoples, as in Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And I want you to be, listen very carefully to the next quote. London boasts of having every nationality within its city limits. And my research indicates further that also within the city of London, there is spoken every known language still in use in the entire world. And that fits well where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And as you well know, starting in July, London, England will be hosting the Olympics where the peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues are going to gather. And to continue, an interesting scripture concerning the mother of harlots is found in Revelation chapter 18, verse 7. It reads, 
how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Could this scripture signify the seat of mystery Babylon as well as it allude to an actual queen sitting on the modern Babylonian throne? Consider Queen Elizabeth II of England. As head of state, she is patroness of English Freemasonry and head of the Church of England. Her consort, Prince Philip, the third Duke of Edinburgh, is a Mason. Grand Master of the British Brotherhood is the Duke of Kent, the Queen's cousin. In January 1983, the Queen and her consort toured the United States. There seemed to be no apparent reason for her visit, other than the honor bestowed on her by the Bohemian Club of California during the last evening of her stay. It was quite an extravaganza. The Bohemian Club is a West Coast center for the inner elite of Templar Scottish Rite Freemasonry in the United States. Some of its members are Senator Alan Cranston, FBI Director William Webster, former Secretary of State George Schultz, and Henry Kissinger. On February 3, 1983, a five-minute segment of the Bohemian Club's extravaganza in honor of Queen Elizabeth was aired on all three television networks. The event began with a view of the Queen sitting slightly high in the middle of the auditorium, as if on top of a pyramid. Two dancers entered the stage wearing huge hats hanging from cables. The cone of the first hat was representative of a walled city with a pyramid, or ziggurat, towering in the middle. Obviously, it portrayed ancient Babylon. At the base of the pyramid, two doors continuously flapped open and shut, displaying inside a large picture of Prince Charles successor to the British throne, and his wife, Princess Diana. As the dancer and hat moved stage right, the second dancer entered from stage left. The cone on the second hat portrayed the city of London, with Big Ben towering in the center. When both dancers centered themselves with the brims of the huge hats reaching from one end of the stage to the other, a voice bellowed, O Queen, we have transversed the ages from Babylon to London, ever so slightly and without a smile, Queen Elizabeth nodded as if in agreement to the statement. That night, the Bohemian Club, an arm of Templar Scottish Rite Freemasonry, acknowledged London as the seat of Mystery Babylon. Queen Elizabeth accepted that acknowledgement. If London is the city that the Apostle John saw in his vision, Queen Elizabeth's life and nation will be short-lived if Jesus Christ is not tarried. For who knows better the headquarters of its rival than the ruthless French Knights Templar Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. There will come a time when God will no longer tolerate the sins of mystery Babylon and will destroy her. Before that happens, however, God in his mercy warns his people to serve their relationship with the whore of Babylon. In Revelation chapter 18 verses 4 and 5, God pleads, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven. And God hath remembers her iniquities. Revelation chapter 17 verses 12 and 18 and all of Revelation 18 record the end time destruction of mystery Babylon. The Holocaust there described is so rapid and complete that it seems reasonable to speculate that such destruction can only be accomplished by modern nuclear weaponry. I want to repeat that for everybody. The Holocaust there described is so rapid and complete that it seems reasonable to speculate that such destruction can only be accomplished by modern nuclear weaponry. Revelation chapter 18 verses 10 and 11 describes the financial depression that is destruction will bring upon the whole earth. I want to repeat that again. Revelation chapter 18 verses 10 through 11 describes the financial depression that this destruction will bring upon the whole earth. Alas, alas, the great city of Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The headquarters of Mystery Babylon cannot be Rome. It should be obvious that if Rome were obliterated by a nuclear bomb today, the world economic system would not suffer. Conversely, if London 
the financial capital of the world, the financial capital of the world, again, the financial capital of the world were likewise destroyed. The world economic system would suddenly collapse, as indicated in the scripture above. English Freemasonry is the mother of harlots. London is modern Babylon. Ground Zero is at 10 Duke Street, St. James, London, England, the 33rd degree Supreme Council headquarters of English Freemasonry. With her control of world politics and world finance, English Freemasonry resembles ancient mystery Babylon. Moreover, her ceremonial rites and symbols contain many pagan elements reminiscent of Babylonian mystery religions. The remainder of this book will compare these rites and symbols with those of ancient Babylon to further document that English Freemasonry is modern mystery Babylon. And that concludes the documented research from John Daniel in the book Scarlet and the Beast. And what I would like to say is, is that all of you that are listening here know That London, England, as I've said before, is about ready to host the Olympics. And one can go on YouTube at this very moment and you can look and see how many videos, whether they be fanciful, factual, fictional, or not, Um, fanciful, fictional, or not, or completely out of somebody's wildest dreams, that quite possibly London, England will be destroyed during the Olympics with a nuclear weapon, which will, as it's said in the book, send worldwide markets of the world into total collapse. And once the worldwide system as we know it goes into total collapse, there will be worldwide chaos. And the motto of Freemasonry and the Illuminati is Ordo Ab Chao. And if you don't understand Latin, I'll explain to you what Ordo Ab Chao means. It means, in English, order out of chaos. They will create the chaos and they will bring the order. And London, England will be the tipping point in the countdown to create a one world government. And to say that I have talked to people from England that live near London and as of right now you will not hear this on the news, but they've practically turned the city of London into a war zone. They have anti-missile batteries positioned all over the city. They have sent their largest warships up the Thames River in preparation for the Olympics. They have British troops stationed all over the city. And they, are in, and they are preparing for an event. And one does not position anti-missile batteries all over their city for an attack that's going to come from the ground. The attack will come from the air. And at this point in time in the world, there are only a few nations that are capable of attacking England from the air. Well, there are many, but United States, Canada, Great Britain itself, France, Germany, Italy, Russia, some other European countries. But what they will do 
is they will connect the destruction of London to Iran building nuclear weapons. And I believe that if they do destroy London, they will use that as an excuse for a wider war in the Middle East, which they have planned. They have planned three world wars, and they've planned them as far back as 1881. And if you dig deep enough in history, you will find out that they did. And the two men that planned them were two men by the name of Albert Pike and Giuseppe Mazzini. Giuseppe Mazzini was the head of Italian Freemasonry, and Albert Pike was the sovereign grand commander of Scottish Rite Freemasonry in the entire world. And if you learn to read between the lines, and if you learn to open up your eyes, you can see at this point in time in the next two months that we are under a great, great threat. A threat by some of the darkest forces that have ever existed on the face of this earth. And with sufficient exposure, we may be able to avert such terrible crises. We must make an effort, ladies and gentlemen, to educate our family, educate our friends to the dangers that we are in. If we don't, not only will the United States be lost, but the entire world will be lost. The world will be plunged into a darkness that will make the reign of terror look like a child's Sunday baptism. And once that happens, it may be too late to regain anything for the future of mankind. And I would remind everybody that you must prepare yourselves and your family for an event that these things happen. You need to go buy arms and ammunition. You need to go buy food. You need to go buy some form of silver or gold to use as trade and barter because if the financial system collapses, and they destroy London, England, there will be utter economic chaos all over this world. And you will not be able to buy anything with your debit cards or your credit cards or the worthless money that's sitting in your wallet because they will freeze all of those assets. You will not have access to them. You will not have access to buy anything. So it is better to prepared not be prepared now than to be sorry in the future. We are sitting at the crossroads of history as I speak. Every one of us has a choice inside their own hearts and inside their own souls. Whether you're going to side with the forces of good or you're going to side with the forces of evil. And it does not matter if you believe in God or believe in a higher power. It does not matter if you believe in Jesus Christ or Buddha or Allah or Muhammad or Zoroaster or Shiva or Krishna or any of those gods. What matters is is that good and evil have always existed in this world. And that battle between good and evil has always went on. And it's about to culminate in which I in an event which I believe is going to be a disaster for the fate of mankind. So we must, as a people, and as Americans, and as Canadians, and as Germans, as Finns, as Italians, Whoever you are, wherever you're listening, stand up for yourself, stand up for your rights, stand up for what is good in the world, and always, always oppose which is dark and which is evil. We must do this not only for ourselves, but we must do this for the future of our children. We have, all of us, the right to live 
as we choose to live in freedom, no matter where you live on the face of this earth, you have a right to be free. To do the things that you choose to do, to work where you want to work, to raise your family as you see fit, to love your husband, to love your wife, to be married, to not be married. But there are people in this world, and they have always existed, that believe that you do not have those rights. That when you are born, that you are to be controlled from cradle to grave, and that's probably an exclusive American statement based upon the political situations of the time, but there are people in this world that have never been free. They don't know what freedom is. They've always been owned by the king or the queen or the landowner or the baron or in a lot of cases even the church has made people slaves. And if we do not wake up not only here in America but all over this world you will see what true misery is, what true sadness is, what true darkness is. If London, England goes, the financial center of the world, it will accelerate everything at a rapid pace. They will move so fast that it will defy your beliefs, it will defy logic. And unfortunately, I guess, for many of us, the only thing that we can do is wait and see how this all plays out. But as I want to remind you, you need to prepare yourself not only, like I said, with arms and ammunition, food and clothing, medical supplies and medical gear, you need to arm yourself with the truth and you need to put on the armor of God and you need to arm yourself with righteousness because this is a religious battle. There was a point in time in my life when I didn't believe in God. And when I finally became awake in the year 1992, I realized that there is a God and that this battle that's going on in this world that's been fought for centuries is a battle for man's soul. It's a battle for his soul. It's a battle for his mind. And I'm not claiming to be the greatest person on the face of this earth. I'm not without sin, and I admit that. I've done many things in my life that I'm not proud of. But I will not be a slave in a global government. And what I'm trying to do with this broadcast is to help awaken other people to make them aware of the dangers that we're in because we are in real danger so what I would like to say is in conclusion of the broadcast is be aware and arm yourself with the truth and we'll be on the air again next Saturday 9pm central time and Tune in to www.awakenradio.net and I would like to say go on the internet and go to www.williamcooper.com He had the show The Hour of Time, The Man That Woke Me Up and go take a look at some of his research as well. Everything's well documented, well sourced. So, good night and God bless you. Owner at awakenradio.net, and I do want to thank you so much for your support, for taking time to visit our website, and listening to our many delightful and informative and inspirational hosts at Awakened Radio.